All right, everyone, welcome to the sellout show. Woohoo! You are watching the raw and uncut version. And today I want to say, we're number one. We're number one. We're number <laughs> so one. perfect. Yeah. No, no. What I'm really referring to is uh, what does it take to be number one? We have a really cool guest today, and I'm going to have Diana tell you about this guest. Diana? There's this amazing podcaster out there. His name is Scott Ingram. And he only interviews the number one or the top one percenters at their companies. And he happens to also be a practitioner who's also always number one. So um, this is, you know, take some time, put on your seatbelt. There's some knowledge bombs coming your way that are going to make a huge difference for your sales practice. Right. You can take it direct from this uh, uh, show and put it in your practice today, right? All right. Watch the live. I say live. Yes, yeah, live for you. Watch the Ron Uncut version and subscribe, people. Subscribe. <laughs> we are recording. Excellent. So I want to welcome you, Scott. Thank you so much. Um, so, Sean, this is Scott Ingram, and he, as you know, because we've been watching you, Scott, is he actually not runs, creepy uh, like. That's creepy. Not, That's not totally creepy. creepy. Like. No. <laughs> well, we are a little stalker. <laughs> I've seen your show. I've seen that in you. Just a little bit. The, the good kind. The good kind, right? Not, not restraining order stalker. Well, the reason I'm so excited to have you on today, Scott, and it's kind of a funny story because um, you, you wanted to be on the pod. You know, we sort of connected and then I started to see you on some stuff and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't like come through the phone and jump on the opportunity to connect with you. I was just so busy and I'm like, oh my God, this guy's a really big deal. So we're really honored that you that you wanted to be on the video cast today. But um, the one thing that we love that Sean and I love about your podcast is that you really speak to the number one people and you're a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So right. I think those are the messages that Sean and I really care about the most is to get this really actionable tan. Like I got ink on paper yesterday with a deal mm -hmm. that I've been trying to pull across the line. Right. So those are the stories that I think people really need to hear. So welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, what do we want to? What do we want to? Uh, what do we want to glean from Scott today? What kind of really awesome knowledge, um, Scott? Is there anything you want to share to set this up uh, with our, like you said, our three thousand four hundred fifty-two subscribers? Yeah. Well, you know what? When you when you shared sort of the the working title for the show, it caused me to do some really great work. I I think because. I actually enjoy, I don't have really a venue in my own podcast. On my show, I only talk to either number one or top 1% individual contributors. It's all individual contributors and they have to be the, the best at the game. Right. But there's, there's no place in those conversations that I really get to dissect and look across conversations and look for the themes and look for the mm -hmm. commonality. So when you ask about, you know, what is the road to number one or to the top 1%, mm -hmm. I, I did some work this morning and, and basically boiled it down to kind of six, six things to get people started. Ooh, and so why don't we start there and then we can Love ride it. wherever we want from, from there. So I think the first thing is where you start matters. And, and what I mean by that is the company that you're working for, you have to really get into the right position. Yeah. And it's about, first of all, if you don't believe in the product or the solution that you're selling and you can't get passionate about that, you're never going to be number one. You can't, it's, it's, I, I, I'm pretty convinced it's physically impossible. <laughs> so you've got to find the right spot, the right company. And I don't think I have found a number one seller who is successful despite their leadership. Mm. You have to be working for somebody that yeah. is going to support you and is going to enable you. And in my own experience, I've seen both sides of this. And for me, the difference is, and this, it, this ties back to the last point, so I'm going to foreshadow here a little bit, but the very best are themselves, right? They're not... They're, they're, they tend to be very, very far from what people think of as the stereotypical seller and what they think the number one person is, right? They're, they're much more human. They're much more authentic. They're much more caring, uh, particularly about their clients and about their results. And so you have to find a leader who is going to help you be the best you and not try and force 
their way and their process on you. And, and I think that's the trap of um, great salespeople moving into leadership is like, this is how I did it. I was successful. Why can't you do it my way? Well, they're not you. Right. And, and that's, that's the recipe for failure as a sales yeah. leader. So that goes along. So Diana has this great point and um, we talk in a show about interviewing for great sales roles. And she said, make sure you are talking to the person you'd be working for. Like make sure you are interviewing that manager, that leader, so, you know, in that process so that you get that vibe. You totally understand who you're working for. Well, and I think there's, there's so much due diligence you really have to do as a salesperson, because if you think about it, I always thought of, first of all, I mean, interviewing and finding a new sales job, that is a sales process. Yeah. So you build a pipeline, right? You find a variety of companies that you might want to work for, and then you're doing discovery meetings, and, you're, and, and then you know, if you want to close the deal, if it is the right fit, well, then you go about that process, right? You, you're setting yeah. deadlines, and you're moving the deal forward. But right. I think you have got to talk to people. Ask for, ask to talk to the best salesperson in the organization and interview them and get the truth and get, talk to a few people, talk to somebody who's three or six months in and, and ask about how their onboarding is going and what's, what's working, what's not working. And then talk to people that have been there for a while. Talk to people who don't work there anymore. Yeah. Because that's where you get the real truth, right? Because a lot of times like, ah, I can't tell you what's really going on because this might come back on me. Find people who have worked for particularly that man, the, your direct manager. That is probably the biggest ingredient there. Find people who have worked for them before because I've got a couple of the nasties that I've worked for. I love talking to people that are, that are smart enough to reach out to me and vet that because I will tell them, <laughs> go far, far away. Yeah. You know, it's so, I just have to jump in here. It's so perfect. We, um, we just released the ebook. It was a tax day. Uh, it was a tax day gift to people with the salary. The average salary of the seller in the United States is 62.5. And so one of the things I know, but there's so much <laughs> wow. more available in sales, right? Yeah. So we wrote this ebook. Many multiples. And, um, Sean and I are building some programs around this idea of the solid six blueprint. And it's how to go from five to six figures in sales. But what's so funny is the second element, so there are six elements of getting to the solid six, and the second element is location, 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 and it's all about the right boss, the right territory, the right comp plan, the right product, and the right company, and you just are really nailing that. So I'm feeling really happy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Real world validation. Well, let's, yeah. let's go on to the second thing, and that is about finding mentors. Mm -hmm. And so the first part of this, I think, is pretty intuitive. The second part, maybe not. So the first part is, again, find the best people in the organization who are delivering and make them your friend, right? Bring them coffee, do whatever you need to do to begin to build that relationship and have them help you. You really need that kind of an ally. Um, I think it was, I think it was Kyle Gutzler who, who did this and we'll talk about him in a little bit more here. Kyle doubled his sales in the process of, of one year, one year to the next, he doubled his results. So we'll come back to that. But one of the things he did is he basically built like a monthly breakfast mastermind thing with the best sellers in the company. He wow. wasn't there yet, right? He was about to lap them all, but he brought them together and that's how he added value. And frankly, that's what I do. I am friends with some of the most amazing salespeople on the planet because I have a podcast and I interview them and I'm able to bring value to them in that way. So that's the obvious part, right? The not obvious part is find a mentor who is representative of your prospects and your clients. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. So that you can get inside their head, understand how they think. And if you, if you treat that, don't try and sell them, right? This is just about a relationship to help you get better. And if, don't worry, they'll buy from you, right? Like if, <laughs> if, if you're genuine in that relationship, like it comes, it's natural. Yeah. But if you do it right, they will be able to refer you. They'll be able to do reference calls. There's amazing things that, that come out of that. And I think that's probably more important. And, and Colin Spector talked about this when I interviewed him. He's at Namely. And when he first started, he wasn't worried about learning about the product and the, the features and benefits. He was worried about learning about his customers and why they buy and how they make these decisions. And that is, that's the recipe to lay just an incredible foundation. That's so smart. That's actually, I've talked about that 
I wrote an article a long time ago about the five people you need in your tribe. And one of them was a mentor. And it was really specifically saying not in your industry, but someone who can open up their brain and tell you how your customers think or the people that you're going to be targeting think because who gives a crap about the way the people in your industry think? I mean, really? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Matter. Well, and I mean, find a sales mentor outside of your industry. I mean, that's one of the things that I try and do in my podcast is go very broad in right. terms of the types of industries that we talk to, because inside your industry, it's an echo chamber. Everybody does it exactly the same way. Well, yeah. what if you were different? Yes. <laughs> what if? What if? What if? I love that question. Yeah, really absolutely. Good. So what's your third thing? So the third thing is you've got to figure out your process and your approach. And so there's, there's two episodes and what I'll do is I'll try to consolidate this. I'll consolidate my notes and put together links to some of these clips and some of these episodes. Awesome. Um, if, if folks go to top one.fm forward slash sell out, I'll put it all there. Um, so listen to, so David Weiss, David is, David is awesome. So he is at ADP and ADP does this thing. And I spent a little bit of time at ADP. They do this deal like if you beat your numbers pretty consistently and pretty significantly, they will come to you and say, hey, Scott, you're so great. We've got this deal for you. We're going to put you in this elite group of sellers and call you an elite quota carrier, which is basically an excuse for them to give you a monumentally huge quota. Right. So that's what it sounded like to me. <laughs> that's pretty much how it goes. There's a few little perks and benefits, but mostly we're just going to give you a huge number, but you're going to be competing with people. You're going to be competing with the A players. So there, it makes sense and you're going to make a lot of money. David was tagged as an elite quota carrier and then did 200% of that number. Oh my gosh. And David's, David believes that like sales is a science right? And, and you just have to kind of build the formula. And it's a lot of work to do that. Yeah. Um, but, but it is possible. So that's a really great place to start. I, I love David. I love his approach. Justin Bridgemahan um, was it influitive at the time. And his approach was he's a very like introverted, analytical guy, didn't read a lot, had never been in sales, didn't read a lot of sales books, but was like really into psychology. And he basically set up a process. It's, it's kind of Sandler without him knowing Sandler. It's just very upfront and having people like you have to buy into my process and the way that we're going to do this, because I know that the way I do it is going to make you successful. And I've done this many times over. So if you'll follow me and work with me in this way, we'll go do this together and be successful. And the way that he set that up is really, really brilliant. In fact, we did a follow-up interview um, on it on YouTube. I, I don't do this YouTube stuff very much, um, but I'll, I'll put a link to that as well because we dug into that specifically in terms of how he sets it up because one of the one of my listeners came up and was like, we got to hear more about this. You know, help, me, help me understand. It's, it's a really, really beautiful process and it's so him, right? So it, it all comes back to that, right? Like you have to connect these approaches and, and you have to cherry pick. I, I haven't found anybody that is like lock, stock, and barrel one particular approach. They're like, I'm 100% Sandler. I'm 100% Challenger. Like, no, I've taken the best of across a whole variety of methodologies and I've built an approach that works for me and who I am and my space and my customers. And that's how you get to that, 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 that system, right? But it's your system and you have to build that process. You have to build that approach for yourself. Uh, yeah, and this is so on our show when I do, when I do this, it's like preach. This is I'm <laughs> preach, brother, preach. I, I, that's the whole reason I built my agency was because of all the different stuff out there. Rolling up to sales training, this is what happens. All right, here's your new sales training. Oh, it's sales kickoff. We got to introduce something spiffy and sparkly and shiny. Let's this year it's the challenger sale. Do this, and if everyone does this the same way, everyone will be successful. Oh, don't do the stuff you did before. And it's, it's stupid. It's just <laughs> so stupid. Yep. It's ridiculous to think that any one way is going to work for any one person, any market, any one industry. And let's put some common sense around and build a selling mix. Like we have a promotional mix, we have a marketing mix. Let's build a selling mix and draw from your own genius, reflect what your customers want to hear, and, you know, use your intuition, apply intention, and you'll just be fine. You'll be fine. 
Yeah. And, and I no, think that's no. the challenge of sales leadership today, right? Like yeah. you, it's about that coaching. It's about the, the way, what I look for in my sales leaders. And I totally cheated. Two months ago, I recruited my own boss. This is the <laughs> third time that we've worked together in, in the company. So I, I totally set, set the deck. That is so smart. But I come out of the box. I'm pretty damn good, right? But I, there's always better and I need to be polished, right? So I let me bring my ideas and present, this is the approach that I'm wanting to take. How can we take this to the next level, right? What, like, what am I not thinking about? What haven't I addressed? Now, whether that's we're, we're working on a specific deal and here's my plan within that deal or with this particular account, or it might be my territory plan in general, right? It's how do we polish that? How do we take the process that I've built over years and make it even better? Because it's never done. No, and you know what I love about what you were talking about too, Scott, is that it's going to be different at every company, but where, where your interviewee, and now I've forgotten his name, but was, he was thinking about what's going to make my customers successful in this process. And then he engineered the process that way rather than, you know, how, how am I going to move somebody through my process? I mean, it did become his process that he owned, but it sounds like he was really looking from what's going to make my customer the most successful. And I think that's really brilliant. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I mean, that was a scenario where it was that type of organization where he was pure new logo field sales. So once yeah. that deal closed, he was going to hand it off. But the very best, even when they're in that scenario, they take ownership of the results of the client, not the result of, hey, cool, I got your signature on a contract. I'm right. out of here. I'm never talking to you again. Because, you know, because that doesn't lead to the references and the referrals and the things that are going to help you really hit the, the hockey stick with your career, right? You have to do right by your customers or it is going to come and bite you in the ass. Well, one of the things I think that's super important to emphasize about what you're saying in this point is something that Diane and I have done a show about this too, is that the way you onboard and ramp new salespeople to your company, it's usually backwards. What it's usually backwards in that most companies start with, well, here's our product. Here's the features of our product. Get to know our product. So we make our product. And so if you concentrate on the product, what do you think salespeople are going to go out and start concentrating on when they go to sell the product? But so when we build playbooks, every single piece of that playbook is linked back to where the customer is coming from. What, why is the customer looking for a solution? How do they identify their problems? How does that relate back to us? So the playbook and onboarding is absolutely 100% customer centric. And then if that's the way you onboard and train people, that is the place from which they'll start selling. I love that. I love that. And, and that, that is the key, right? It's, it's customer first. You have to understand your customer what? and their challenge and what they're trying to solve for. Your thing is just a freaking thing, right? <laughs> what they care about is what's the result, right? What's the outcome uh, that I'm going to get from doing business with you? Isn't it amazing that we're still talking about this? Like it's a freaking new concept. Well, it's not <laughs> easy though. Oh. It's just not easy. <laughs> yeah. Easy to say, but it's not easy to implement. Yeah. And yeah, if your right. manager is like, make the call, did you move them to the la la la? And you know, what's the number? And are you and, and doesn't even give you any time to think about yeah. anything except your number and your goal. You're you're in a you're in a bad situation as a salesperson. Bad place. Very dark, yep. bad place. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's sure. number four? So number four is do the work. You know, it, at the end of the day all being the smartest person on the planet is great, but you can't get there without working your tail off. And so it, it was funny. I just pretty recent interview, I talked with Paul DiVincenzo, who guy from CentOS. I mean, this, this story is epic. Last year, he sold $13.7 million in total contract value at CentOS. These people sell uniforms and first aid kits and crud. That's a lot of uniforms. Wow. And he's been number one four of the last five years in a row. So that's the other thing I look for is I, I have no interest in somebody who got lucky one time one year because they just walked into just a great deal right, and they've not right. been able to repeat what they're doing. Paul has done this in multiple markets in multiple verticals, starting nearly from scratch every single time. Um, so his story is incredible. And he made this comment towards the end. He said, um, they have to sacrifice something to get there. And if they can get without it, more power to them. They're just better than me. Be, but I think putting hard work in is what it comes down to, right? So again, smart guy, 
super intelligent approach, but at the end of the day, you just have to do the work. And I'll add kind of two other elements to that. Um, I will, I try and pretty regularly bring SDRs onto the show. I had a little bit of a drought, so I've, I've got back-to-back -back SDR interviews coming up. In fact, I just interviewed Josh Sutton yesterday, who I know you've had on your show. Ah, I was going to say, you got to interview Josh, and Reed Oliver is really good too. Okay. Yep. Yep. But, well, okay. Reed's been on the show. Reed's been on the show as well. I, I, in fact, you made a comment that you thought your interview with him might be better. Oh, right. So, you, you know, I've been meaning to call you out on that. I do pay attention. <laughs> but oh, I'm so sorry, Scott. I'm no, sorry. it's all good. So one of my favorites um, is an interview I did with Florin Tatulia. And Florin was in an SDR role at the time. And again, like very analytical guy. And he measured a lot of what he did so that he could tell you empirically, yeah. this is working better than that. I'm going to do more of this. So the, the point of that is find ways to measure some of what you're doing so that right. you can improve. Yeah. And then Dewan Brown, uh, who's at Bloomberg BNA, he would just, he would find, he would look at like one little thing about his process and tear it apart and figure out how he could improve it. So one of the things he dug into at, at, previous to our conversation was scheduling. He's like, okay, how do I make scheduling meetings easier? And he did all the due diligence and kind of looked at different tools and found the best process that worked for him and for his clients um, so that he could do scheduling. Cause it's, it's, it sucks, but it's something you got to do. So he found a solution for that. And again, that's the way you improve the process. It's not just this giant holistic thing. It's focus. Like, okay, what's one thing that I can laser narrow focus in on, make that thing better, get it locked down. Okay, great. Now let's move on to the next thing and focus on what, what thing is going to have the biggest impact in your process and where it is today. Hmm. It's really interesting. I think we're seeing such a shift in uh, sales is in this really interesting place right now. Whereas, you know, before the technology and support we had for sales and selling people for, for hundreds of years, decades were selling on their charisma and those soft skills, soft skills, the ability to persuade and convince people. And now as we have technologies advancing buyers and stuff, we need, we're, we're seeing more successful sellers who have the grit to understand digging into a process and understanding the numbers and what does the data tell us. And then you put on the soft skills and that's when you're having success. You can't just soft skill it. <laughs> you can't yeah. just soft skill it alone anymore. Right. You've got to understand what part of your process is working, what's broken. Well, and, and as soon as you can hard skill it, then we get replaced by robots. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so let's, let's hope the human thing remains important because we're all screwed otherwise. <laughs> well, and I, I we can go, that's a whole other show. <laughs> that's a whole other show. I, I know what we're going to call it too, but because um, AI looks like Al, if you just write AI, it looks like Al. So we're going to be, you can call me Betty, but I'll call you anyway. <laughs> I like it. I like yeah. it. So moving on, um, I think that's a brilliant, brilliant point. Um, I can't wait to hear what's number five. Yeah, so the, the last two are quick and, and we've already alluded to both of them. So you can't forget the mindset, right? The, the way that you think about this and go into this. And, and again, I think that the, one of the best examples of that was Kyle Gutzler and, and just the mindset that he went into and basically said, I'm going to double my sales. And actually, Josh Sutton yesterday, this, this episode will be out when, when we go live with this. He said he walks into the office one day and walks up to his leadership and says, what's the record for the, the most meetings that have ever been set in a day? And they looked it up and they're like, it was nine. He says, okay, I'm going to beat it today. And he set 10 meetings that day. Like literally Babe Ruth called the shot, said, I'm going to set the record for the most, most number of meetings. But it matters, right? I like guy, having, yeah. Yeah. sometimes having that swagger and having that mindset of, God damn it, I can freaking do this and here's what I'm going to do. Sometimes you don't even know the how, right? And, and that's kind of where I'm at right now, right? I carry a $3 million number. God damn it, I'm getting to $4 million. I still don't know how quite yet, but I will find a way to get there. 
<laughs> so, you know, you, you have to take that kind of an approach. And then the last point, like I said earlier, is just be yourself. And I did a bonus episode about this with Paul DiVincenzo, so the guy from CentOS, because we, it was one of my longer interviews. I think that thing was like an hour and 40 minutes. It was, it was epic. Wow. And he sends me an email that afternoon sort of summing it all up. And I was like, we didn't talk about this at all. We talked for an hour and 40 minutes and you're telling me the thing. It all boils down to you have to be authentically yourself and you didn't even mention this in any way. So I'm like, sorry, man, you got to talk to me again. I know we just spent two hours talking. We got we to gotta talk again. And we did just a short bonus episode talking about that thing. And again, our timing is just a little bit too tight here. Um, but I'm doing a summit here in Austin called the Sales Success Summit, May 7th and 8th. And I'm bringing together literally half of the people who've been on my show. At, at, <laughs> at this point today, 20 of the 40 some odd um, are, are going to be there. They're the ones that are on the stage. Yeah. And so as soon as we had that conversation, I was like, Paul, it's a month from now, you're going on stage. And so he's presenting uh, this this. How to how so we talked about the why in the podcast episode, but in the event we're going to talk about how how do you maintain yourself through all of these processes, many of them being imposed upon you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Diane and I are. I mean, that's actually a topic we. When you bring the sellout show live to stage, that's a topic that we have mm -hmm. discussed. Was personality is a it's a competitive advantage and how do you yep. use that and drive that in all the channels and all the mediums to create a continuity of experience for buyers and if you can do that you are so much further ahead of people who are just well let's see my marketing and sales enablement set up this and I'm gonna shoot in the dark and try this and let's see what how I'm gonna find today but bringing your personality your own authentic self is a competitive advantage if you can do that throughout the different channels yeah, 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 for sure. It, it, it's about being human. Like you're selling to people, right? Almost all of this, I've always been in B2B, right? But no business has ever signed my agreement, right? right? There's always right. a person. There's a name and a title above that signature. Business is personal. It absolutely is. Yeah. You know, Sean's slug line for her selling agency is we coach humans to sell to other humans because selling like robots is so last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of taglines, I brought props. I, I meant to open this way. So I brought the boots that I wear ah, on the street. Boots on the ground. Yeah. Oh, and, and there's the phone. Oh, God, yep. So, and the story, the story behind these <laughs> boots is actually this pair of boots. Um, I worked for a company and the best SDR I ever worked with um, started this company a few years after the fact. So that pair of boots, and, and they're now three or four years old. That's the first pair of boots that he ever sold. I was his very wow, first paying customer. Awesome. Yeah, just, I, I wanted to be able to support him. You always got to take care of the, the people that are taking care of you. Right. And he's, he's doing great. And, and his story is just awesome too. So if you go to alvies.com, we'll put, I'll put that on that top1.fm forward slash sellout. Um, he's, it's mostly e-commerce, but he's got an Airstream tra trailer in downtown Austin and he sells boots and flip-flops because he figures in Texas, those are the only time, two kinds of shoes. You right. Need. That's all you need. Well, yeah. I, I have a question. So it just, we have a couple of things before we wrap up. So talking about being human. So yeah. whenever we have guests, one of the questions that we certainly like to ask is, Scott, tell us about like your most epically awesome sales fail like when did you absolutely royally <laughs> muck it up big time i want to know because we've all had them and we learn from them and so tell me about your sales fail what'd you learn from it yeah hey, uh, um the the challenge there is choosing which one i mm -hmm. let me let me touch on two because one one i think is speaks to how important the where is i did make a wrong turn at one point in my a really wrong turn at one point in my career and spent seven months with a company and you know, again, when you're in the wrong place, I, I'm typically on like a 50-50 comp plan. If I'm not selling a lot, I'm not making enough money. <laughs> yeah. So it hurt financially really bad. And it was just in the wrong space. And it took me a while to recover from that. So that, that was one. But like the deal-related sales fail... I was, I had a really, really significant, um, and I've, I've been in enterprise sales kind of all along. So very large oil and gas company in Houston, which totally narrows it down, right? Um, and 
we, we go in there. It's a competitive thing. We're very, very well positioned. And it was just a con- I, there, there's such a sequence of horribleness. I, I can't even tell you. I mean, it's one of these like two or three hour demos. We've done all the discovery. This is like we've got everybody in the room. We're presenting the solution for like an hour. We can't get internet access. Um, we can't. I, I mean, it, it, I'm selling a SaaS solution. It was so bad and we just there was no way to recover for it and the lesson from that is you're always especially in SaaS sales you're always dependent on those things and you have to have some kind of backup we were a hundred percent tied to this demo everything was in that demo so not being able to show that and of course we had done a ton of work on it right it was totally personalized and totally relevant but absolutely nothing to fall back on so the lesson from that is you have to have a fallback if there is no internet there's no power you know what are you going to do great screenshots build a deck or re-articulate the things that they said were important and how you're going to solve those things all of that stuff we didn't have it and so trying to do that on a whiteboard and after it was an absolute epic colossal train wreck and it was kind of make or break at that point like we were really trying to break into this industry i had been busting my balls in houston for months trying to get into oil and gas and here was our shot oh. and just absolute swing and a miss uh, so i have found in those instances that interpretive dance goes along. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you haven't seen my dance. That certainly would have made it worse. <laughs> I'm so grateful actually that you would share that because they're very, you know, people have a hard time really telling one on themselves. And that was, that was epic. Yeah. You know, and, and let me add to that because in hindsight, I think the other thing that I did wrong in the aftermath is, and this ties back to one of my favorite books the last few years has been Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't read the book, just just get the book. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's about not, personal not, responsibility. I threw my SE under the bus afterwards. And that, that was wrong, right? Like there was so much stuff that yes, he made mistakes. But at the end of the day, I owned that deal. I owned that presentation. And I didn't take ownership of the fail that it was afterwards like I should have. So that, that was the other kind of lesson that it took me a long time, you know, to, to come back and look at myself and go, actually, Scott, that was totally your fault. Mm. Well, I want to I want to talk about something that you touched on because I think this is really important. You know, we can all talk, all talk about the number one salesperson and blah blah blah, but and the road to it is important. But there, I ran into a pitfall, and it sounds like you have some uh, really juicy advice if you find yourself in the situation. So I was somebody who you know, Sean has been you know absolutely number one in all of her roles. I I was used to being number one everywhere I went and it didn't kind of matter the size of the sales team. And I think it wasn't so much about being smart. Like you said, Scott, it was like, I was willing to outwork anybody, <laughs> you know, I was just willing to outwork anybody. Um, so at any rate, I got myself into a really bad situation. Mine, mine actually went for eight months instead of seven, but, um, it was just bad. And I mean, I, I wasn't, num- I was number like last <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, but I wasn't going to give up. Right. Cause I had this, like, I, I can crack any sales code. I'm so superhero salesperson, whatever I had thinking about myself, but it was demoralizing. And I, I was invited to find other opportunities in the world <laughs> by them. Um, and, uh, but it was it was really demoralizing, and I'm I'm thrilled to say that you know I came out of it in a way better situation, which is lucky. But at the time, I'm I'm just curious what what can you tell people if they're finding themselves in the situation where they're really used to maybe not number one, but being a performer, and they're not performing. And how do you keep your head together and 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 either perform in the job where you are or or find the right place for you? How do you think about that? 
Yes. I mean, such a good question. And, you know, a big question that I have that I think will be a theme within the summit, because I think the challenge within yeah. the individual contributor role is there are so many things that you don't control that contribute mm. to your success, right? right? I don't control that my comp plan is going to change, that my territory is going to change, that my leadership is going to change, that, I mean, I can keep going, right? There's so many things. So how do you deal and how do you make the decision to make the change. I had, you know, a great conversation with Debbie Rapson um, about how she deals with those changes, right? And, you know, she basically just takes the time to look at what is the change? What is the impact? How am I going to deal with it? You know, and she's a strong performer. So there's, you can, nothing is final, right? There's always negotiation and conversation that you can go have with leadership. But she basically takes that as an opportunity to look at the entire picture and evaluate it and and make a decision. But then once that decision is made, like if you're going to decide to stay and stick it out and deal with it, then deal, right? right. And, and Paul, again, at Cintas, that was something that he said where his mistake, because of course I asked him, I'm like, so you were number one, four of five years. What the hell happened in the fifth year? <laughs> right. And it was basically that it was, he didn't mentally get over one of those changes in time to fix yeah. it all the way. He still performed amazingly. Right. But it, it was just, it was too long of a delay. And just, I think the psychology, I mean, the story that I don't, uh, I don't tell maybe enough and I, I won't share the company, but I joined an organization that was absolutely exploding. Um, I went in and in my first uh, quarter on quota had the best first quarter in the history of the company record still stands. It was Q4. I made club in that one quarter. They changed the rules because of me after that, after I went to wherever we went, Aruba or something. Yeah. And that next quarter, we doubled the size of the sales team. And this was not a small sales team. Like it was a giant doubling. They reorganized things. They put together kind of different um, uh, um, markets and, and things like that. So I was part of a team of eight people. And we were together for three quarters. And one time, one of those quarters. So one out of 24, somebody made their number. Ouch. And I, at the end of that, was also asked to leave based on my performance. And I was like, are you serious? But here, so there, were, there were two things, right? One was like the during. If I could go back and do that over again, Diana, like you, I took it all on me. Like, God damn it, I will figure out a way to do this because I don't suck. And I didn't, ask for, I didn't ask for help. And more importantly, I didn't go, wait a minute it's not just me, something's not yeah. working. And right. maybe I need to move in because I, it was a great company. Like I would have loved to have found another role. And I started working on that, but it was too late. What's funny is the day before I got walked out, um, I had a meeting with the CEO to talk about this and that never happened. So, <laughs> but when I, when I was driving out of the parking garage after that went down, I decided when I late in life write my memoirs, the chapter of this book is going to be called Fired Up. Right. So yeah. yes, I had been fired, but I knew that it would lead to better things. Right. And it, and it absolutely did. Right. I, I've been on a trajectory shortly after that. I joined Eloqua. Yeah. After that weird wrong turn thing we talked about earlier, I joined Eloqua and that's really the space I've been in ever since. And it has been awesome. I love the space. I love the customers. I've had some great opportunities. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a blast. It fits me. That's so great. And just so you know, in case you're feeling like you're not in a good moving to a better place, you are moving to a better place. I didn't feel like I was moving to a better place. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you know what? I mean, there's, there's been, it's again, it's not always been perfect. It, it's funny when I came into this job. So right now I work for a company called Relationship One and we're a, a professional services firm. They were actually my best partner when I was at Eloqua. Like my mm -hmm. clients that worked with mm -hmm. this group were the most successful clients. And I was, I had one of those things out of my control that changed. I, um, inherited, not inherited. I, I was the recipient of um, <laughs> kind of the worst boss of my life. Oh, and yeah, my life was sucking. <laughs> and I happened to be at a QBR. It was it was the most intelligent place I could have possibly been for the position I was in and what I was trying to solve for. And he sends me a message that morning that just lights me on fire. 
And later that day, ironically, the guy who was leading that QBR is the boss that I recruited. So I'm in his QBR <laughs> and it, the day is kind of wrapped up. The only other person in the room is the CEO of my current company. So we all work together now. And um, I, I, I call Aaron over. I'm like, Aaron, here's what's going on. Like, over the and I'm just fuming all day and, and it, it's sort he's kind of a bully so I've drafted this rather aggressive email and I'm like Aaron here's what's going on will you read this email because it it could be career limiting um it's rather <laughs> aggressive and so he reads the email and our my current CEO overhears this whole thing and he looks at me and I was I was sort of in a I had lost a lot of confidence through that process. Yeah. Right? I, I was not believing in myself and my abilities, but Ron had worked with me. We had co-sold so much business together. He overhears this thing and he, he looks at me and he says, Scott, why don't you let me take you to dinner and buy you like three or four drinks? Um, you can delete that email, send the email I know you really want to send, and I will write you an offer letter tonight. Wow. So I didn't take him up on that. It took me another couple of months to get to my breaking point, but that changed, that changed everything for me. That, like, yeah. that changed the outlook. I was like, oh my God, that's right. I have value. I forgot. <laughs> and everything sort of changed from there. And it, isn't that the type of CEO that you want to be working with, right? So you want leadership that believes in you and who you are and what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, Gosh, so many good gems in this episode. Diana, did you have any other questions? Well, I have you? one other thing, and then I want you to promote. Well, it's probably too late for this conference for when this is going to get released. Maybe somebody will get on a plane at the last minute. You're probably <laughs> sold out. You're probably sold out. But um, the one thing that I've noticed about the people that are on your show as another sort of continuity is creativity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the one that I was most struck by was your. Um, your guest, who was a top seller at a ginormous technology company who didn't have a sales background, which probably helped him a lot, didn't have official sales training, which I think find, I find helps, but um, he would get on his target company's earnings calls mm -hmm. to hear what the freaking CEO and CFO are saying about what's going on in their company and what their goals are and what their mm -hmm. plan. I mean, is that not... Why did I? Why did I never think of that? I was always selling into Fortune 500 for my best part of my for my favorite part of my career so far. Well, this is my favorite, but best job and mind blown. Get on the earnings call. I mean, when you get creative and you think about those strategic advantages that you can, you know, do to get in your customer's head. I mean, I was just so impressed. <laughs> well, and, and that's the value of listening to the best, right? Because you're going to yeah. get those little gems. And, and let's call him out. That was Phil Terrell at Microsoft. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, just incredible stuff. And he, it, it fit him though, right? He had right. this weird, crazy upbringing where he had like a ton of finance acumen. And we were prepping for this. And like, I saw this coming. I was like, you're like a finance major? How the heck do you know all of this? Because he was really deep in it, not just like trying to get the, the big picture themes. Because I'm, I've read, you know, I read 10Ks, I read the annual reports from the right. clients, but I'm just looking for like the, the soft stuff. I can't, I'm not smart enough to dig like super deep into the numbers and go, oh, well, you know, based on your cash flow in Q3, I can see that you're, <laughs> no, I'm not quite there. Your but he image, was. Your image to the is. <laughs> yeah, <up>. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you got to be yourself. You got to use your own natural genius. Yep, that's right. That's, that's right. Exactly. exactly. All right, Sean, do you have, do you have some, oh, so, so Scott, before, before Sean um, wraps you up, but um, what, what would you like to promote? And are you going to be doing another summit next year if people miss this year's summit? What is your summit all about? Yeah, I'm gonna. T I'm telling you like all of my secrets. You guys really got me to open up even more than I, I usually do. Not that I'm not that I don't tell secrets. Um, so the the summit, if you've missed it, we will likely be putting together um, some type of video offering afterwards. I'm working on the videographer right now. So if we don't if we don't have video, we'll at least have audio for the whole thing. And the best thing to do is just go to top one .fm. Go go to the page that I create for this, so you can get all the takeaways. So go to top one .fm forward slash sell out. Um, and I'll have details. You can join the mailing list. That's the best thing to do. Um, that way you see sort of all the announcements. You know, this was, this event was actually my second choice. 
um, of what I wanted to do. Because, you know, for me, it's all about th this inspiration and it's about connecting with people and, and connecting both groups of people, right? For, for those who are number one, when you're number one, by definition, you don't have any peers. All you have is a bullseye on your back. Right. So you kind of have to go look at other organizations for people that are at the top of their game. And a lot of it is how do you deal with being number one? So I wanted to create a space for them to spend time with each other um, to to talk That's through cool. those things, but also to allow all the rest of us who are working to get to a higher level, which is them too, um, to to be able to learn from from them. But and I believe in experiences and I believe in recognition. I've I've had this theory for a long time. Like salespeople have very, very simple wiring. We have two, <laughs> we have two buttons, right? You can press my cash button. I like it when you press that button very much. Thank you. We also have a recognition button. Yeah. And rarely does that recognition button get pressed, nor does it get pressed hard enough. And a lot of times it's bigger than the cash button. So I, I wanted to create that type of thing. So the event that I'd like to do next year, we'll see if I'm able to pull it together. The, the concept is like a president's club cruise. And I've now worked for a few organizations that are smaller where we don't have club. It doesn't make sense. But what if all of those smaller companies could come together, send their best people in a way that they get rewarded and recognized, but also in a way where I am going to light them on fire <laughs> because of who they're going to spend time with. And when they come back, it will be epic. So that's, oh, great. that's where my head is for 2019. In the meantime, best thing to do, again, go to top1.fm, uh, get on the mailing list, see what we're going, doing. And if you're a podcast fan, listen to the, listen, subscribe to the podcast. Um, we also have a YouTube channel. I actually, because my podcasts are too dang long, I told you I had a hundred minute podcast. Um, I also pull out little clips that are in one to two minutes. There's like 400 of them oh, in wow. our YouTube channel at this point. So if you go to top1.fm forward slash YouTube, you can subscribe to that channel and see just those short snippets for like quick motivation and sort of the best of kind of stuff. That's cool. Hey, Sean, do you want to show Scott your skills builder? I bet he'd love it. Oh, sure. So whip it out. People who th this is new. This is new. So very much like um, you, Scott, uh, looked around and went, you know, how, how do we really help salespeople? And of course, what does everyone do? Sales experts, which I decline that. I decline nope. that notion. Nope. I'm a practitioner. Yep. Um, they write a book and I thought, you know what? I don't want to write a book because we don't learn from books. Well, we learn from books, but we don't do from books. So I wanted to build something that sits physically in front of salespeople. That's about building skills and it's about doing. So this is based upon the principles of habit stacking. It's a skills builder and that you take one skill and this particular one for, for a full scope scales people, Mindset, business development, advancing opportunities, productivity, and skill set. You take one skill and you work on that one skill every week. And next week, you work on another skill. And it's stacking habits, building skills. It focuses on the doing, not learning. I mean, I've got, you know, we've, we all read dozens and dozens and dozens of books. But what do you actually really take away from a book? Maybe two or three concepts. But it's not about the doing. So the the battle selling skills builder is about the doing. So we are putting together the website for that. And that is going to be live here in probably just a couple of weeks where people can order that and ship it out. And then just like you, you've got a habit of drinking your cup of coffee in the morning, roll up to your desk and work on that one specific skill every single week. So you start improving and the doing, not the reading, but the doing. Awesome. Very cool. So, so cool. Is, is there like a mailing list that I get on? So I make sure I don't miss that. <laughs> All our guests get one for sure. I guess so I'll be asking. Bonus for me. What about for the people listening? <laughs> yes, I absolutely have a mailing list for that too. Uh, the, it'll be uh, badassskillsbuilder.com will be the website that goes live in a couple of weeks where you can order. We'll put the, we'll put the order link in the, yeah. in the notes. But yeah, um, what's really cool is that Diana is building one for the solid six, how to you know go from five to six figures. We'll have one for inside salespeople. We'll have one for sales leaders. And it's just, it's a low tech solution to incredibly complex problem, which is we're not practicing skills. 
We're not practicing putting skills into habit. It's, oh, well, that's a great concept. And I'll think about that and maybe I'll apply it. Or, or it's, let me read this revolutionary book and try to overhaul my whole entire sales. That doesn't work. So yep, one piece at a time, we'll be building more of them and it's, it's about the doing. So yeah, badassskillsbuilder.com will be where you will go to get that. But. So okay. how does somebody, how does somebody get on your radar screen if they're number one to be invited to your amazing conference and to be invited on your podcast? Cause, cause Sean is number one at her selling agency <laughs> and, and I'm number one over at your <laughs> sales girl in sales. So we'd like to, no, I'm just kidding. But seriously, how does somebody get on your radar screen if they're number one and right. they want to be a part of this community? Yeah. You, usually I seek them out. So one, one trick so is, don't call um, them. Yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll give you my email address in a second because I'm, I'm not shy about that at all. But um, you should absolutely share on LinkedIn when you're going to President's Club and that you're number one because that is a, yeah. frequent, a frequent search that I, that I do. In fact, I have an interview yeah. later today with a top, I'm pretty sure she's a copier sales rep that I discovered actually in your neck of the woods, Diana. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. So yeah, you should absolutely share and brag about yourself about President's Club and being number one. Um, but the easier way is just to email me, scott at top1.fm and say, hey, Scott, I'd like to be on the show. Here's what I've done. And you know, it's, it's a bit, you, one, you've got to be in the position. There's got to be some consistency. Like again, it can't be, I got lucky this one time and uh, we should talk about that because unless you figured out how to repeat that luck, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing useful there. Um, and just, you know, have great story and insights to, to share and be willing to share it. Be yourself, your authentic self, right? That's right. That's right. Speaking of which, all right, this is where we're going to wrap up today. Um, I have a, we call it the back of the envelope question in, that, in which I grab whatever thing near me is not completely covered and write a question on that doesn't really have anything to do with sales, but it's sort of telling about your personality. I actually have a pre-qualifier before I ask you the question. So Scott, am I right to assume that in, you were either in high school or college, say in the early 90s? Um, uh, late, late 90s, yeah. Late 90s, okay. Well, all right. We don't do this to women, only men. <laughs> <laughs> well, because my question was going to be, have you ever had either a mullet or glam metal hair? <laughs> no, I have had neither of those things. You want to try another more interesting question that you get a better answer to? That was really boring. <laughs> well, I've asked this sort of thing before, like West Coast or East Coast, you know, which, which rap battle do you support? <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Well, I grew up on the West Coast. I, I don't know that I was in the scene. See, I was, my only, my rap exposure was much more like 80s hip hop, like DJ Jazzy Jeff uh, yeah. time frame. So <laughs> I, I don't think that that fit into either of those things. They, they weren't warring yet and they, and they weren't gangsters. Mm. Well, that, well, then that answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. And Scott, I mean, I love the aha moments that we got on this show today. I mean, this whole idea of finding a, and I know Sean talked about it, but it kind of, sometimes it takes me a while, but the whole idea of getting a mentor that is in your customer's world is just a game changer. Yeah. Mm. You'll at least get one sale. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> All right. So, is there any are there any nuggets of wisdom you want to drop on us before we um, before we wrap it up here? No, I I think you've pretty well tapped me out. You know, but it it is that sometimes you have to hear things a lot of times. Yeah. You know, I have whole, yeah. heard my entire career the Jim Rohn quote that says you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and only in the last two years, really, since I started the podcast, have I started to really intentionally act on that. So a lot of times you have to hear things many, many times before you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is something that I need to do. It's in the doing, right? It's, it's, in it's the all about doing. Yeah. Okay, I'm way do more it, awesome people. than I thought. First of all, I love your mom, but if I'm the average of the five people I hang out, I am like, I'm so much better than I thought. <laughs> I hang out with some unbelievable people. All right. Anyway, Sean, why don't you take us out of here? <laughs> All right. So at the end of the episode, we've actually changed what we used to say. We, we really want salespeople to know that if they take this and apply this and say, you know, oh, I forgot, actually, I forgot how we queued it up. Scott, thank you so much for being an awesome guest. Yes. And we just want salespeople to know that you've got this. 
-hmm. Trust yourself. Mm -hmm. You've got that. I like it. I like it. You got it. Go do it. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye.